Hello. All the logic and circuitry we've looked at so far has produced an output as fast as electricity can flow through the circuit, and the output is always some combination of the inputs. Computers behave differently. They carry out a sequence of operations. They use sequential logic. And the difference between combination logic and sequential logic is the introduction of time, and in particular with time we get memory. It's memory which makes the difference. There's actually all sorts of different ways that memory can be created, but we're interested in the kind which you might find within the core of a processor. So we're going to start by looking at a little bit of memory and then build up a small piece of sequential logic. So the simplest memory element is probably the set reset latch, which has a symbol which looks like that. You can actually create it using logic gates. Uh, so I've created one uh, using two NOR gates here. And the standout design feature of this arrangement is the cross-coupling where the output of one of the gates is one of the inputs to the other and vice versa. So it has two inputs which I've labelled reset and set and the output. At the moment we have both inputs are zero and our output is zero. If I now take the set input high, our output becomes high because of the way the logic flows. If I now take the set input low, our output is remains high. So we have the same input conditions as we started with, both of these inputs being low, but our output is now different. It's got a memory. It's remembered that the last thing we did was take the set input high. If we now take the reset input to high, our output becomes low. So we can capture that kind of behavior in a little table like this. So when reset and set are both low, situation is stable and the output remains unchanged. If we take the set signal high, we get a high output. Again, if we take the reset high, it becomes low. So this is a simple memory element. It can remember which of these inputs was taken high most recently. You might be wondering what happens if we have both reset and set high. Nothing terrible happens. But this is a set reset latch and the rules of the game are that you either set it or you reset it or you do nothing. You don't try doing both. You can do it if you want. Uh, it's easy enough to work out. But under some conditions you can get some strange effects. So we avoid those by never um, doing that. It's a very important construct, the set reset latch. Um, but you often you don't find it by itself very often. It's usually wrapped up uh, with some other logic to change its behavior. And in particular, to change it from being a latch to what's called a flip-flop. And flip-flops are edge-triggered. I'll show you what that means now. Uh, the most common type of flip-flop is called a D-type flip-flop. Uh, so this is the type I used for designing the mega processor. Um, it has a little table like this, which we'll go through, and a symbol like that. So this table is a bit different in that it has some um, different values in it to the noughts and ones we're used to. X means I don't care. And this little strange shaped S thing um, denotes a transition. It's going from a low to a high. So it's a transition on that signal from low to high. So let's see what that means for the circuit. Starting with our both inputs low, data and clock low, and the output is low. So when the clock is low, it says it doesn't care what the data is. So we can change this input and the output doesn't change. So now I'm going to do, carry out a transition on the clock. I'm going to take it from low to high. And when I did that, the flip-flop looked at the input, data input, and took a snapshot of its value at the instant 
of that transition and change its output to match that snapshot. So the output is now high. Uh, we can change the data now um, because we don't care where the clock's high. We don't care what the data is. We only cared at the moment of transition. So if I want to take the output low, I need to have the data input as low, and then do another low to high transition on the clock. The flip flop takes another snapshot of the data input and sets the output to that value. Now the reason why we're so keen on edge triggered flip flops is that that transition marks an instant of time. If we give that same signal to all of the flip-flops in the system, they will all recognize that same instant of time when the clock does that transition, and all of the flip-flops will update to the new value at the same instant of time. And it's that synchronous behavior, everything happening together, which allows us to build processes the way we do. Now I've called this signal the clock, for these demonstrations, I'm controlling it with a switch. Um, it can be controlled by logic circuits if you want. Sometimes people do that. It tends to be relatively rare. Usually in a system, it's controlled by a special circuit called an oscillator. And an oscillator generates a series of pulses. If you look at it on the oscilloscope, it'll look a bit like this. So this is a sequence of pulses and each of those pulses starts with a low to high transition. So if we give that signal to the flip-flops, they will see a train of instants of time, of moments in time. And they'll all change to new values at the same moments of time. And it's that which gives the system a sense of time. It's what drives it through its paces. When you buy a computer and you're asking what speed the computer runs at, you'll get an answer nowadays of a few gigahertz. That speed refers to the clock signal that you'll find inside a processor. So the faster that clock speed, the faster the flip-flops in the processor will be changing thing, state, and you'll be changing values. So now let's look at a little bit of sequential logic. So we have here uh, two flip-flops and a little bit of combinatorial logic in front of the flip-flops. We're starting with the flip-flops both having a value of zero. So the combinatorial logic has already worked out what it wants to do next. So it wants to set the next input of A high and of B to be low again. So if we now put a transition on the clock, take it from low to high, the flip-flops will update to those new values. So I have one and zero. The combinatorial logic has calculated what to do with those new values immediately, faster than we can see. And it's decided that next inputs should be zero and one. So if we do another transition on the clock, our flip-flops update to those values of zero and one. Again, the combinatorial logic combinational logic has worked out the next values, which will be 1 and 1. So if we do another clock transition, those values go through and the flip-flops become 1 and 1. The next inputs are going to be 0 and 0. So update, the flip-flops become 0 and 0, and we're back where we started. This little circuit introduces a very important new concept, which is that of state. The state of a system is the value that's in the flip-flops. So at the moment, the state of this system is that A is zero and B is zero. And it's state which kind of makes the difference between combinational logic and sequential logic. In combinational logic, the output is a combination of inputs. When we're dealing with sequential logic, the next state is formed from combination of the current state and any inputs.
When designing a system like this, or trying to understand one, uh, we often use uh, something that's called a timing diagram, where we can uh, represent this on a piece of paper. I've drawn one here, and it looks like this. So we see the clock signal along the top, and then we see a line for each of the flip-flops. And this shows us how they changed over time. So A alternated 0, 1, 0, 1, like so, and B changed like this. Now I've drawn these two flip-flops as distinct items, because they are distinct items. Uh, but we can think of them as being as forming one unit. And when we start to think of flip-flops joining together, we often refer to that construct as a register. So here we have a two-bit register um, called AB. And we can add a line on the diagram to show the behavior of AB. And it's State is a combination, as you'd expect, of the individual flip-flops A and B. If we look at this sequence, we can see that this is counting in binary. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, and then we wrap around and start from 0 again. So this little circuit is a 2-bit counter. As it's a two-bit counter, there is a fixed pattern of states um, it can move through. Starts at zero, then goes one, two, three, and then back to zero, and so forth. It's a counter, that's what it has to do. But it's possible to build systems which go through a much more complex sequence of states, potentially infinite variety of states, infinite sequence of states. And that's starting to get closer to the behavior of a processor. So the next thing we're going to look at is the state machine.